Uh, now there are a few um, scriptures to share. The first one is Luke chapter 9, from verse 48 to 50. Luke chapter 9, from verse 48. The other, the other scripture that comes is, Do unto others what you would have them do unto you. So God wants us to think of his perfect and good will and begin to release it unto others. Because you want the others, as you sow this good seed to them, you want them to do the same to you. You are not passive, but you are taking the initiative out of love. Love is our motivation. So you take on the motivation of love and you begin to do unto others what you see as good. And then they will do it back unto yourself. So a good seed and you shall reap a harvest of righteousness in Jesus' name. Amen. This is in relationship and treatment unto others now. Now Luke 9, 48 to 50. Now Jesus said to them, whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me, welcomes the one who sent me. That's Heavenly Father who sent Jesus. For he who is least among you all, he is the greatest. Now, that's powerful. Master, said John, we saw a man driving out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he's not one of us. And Jesus said, do not stop him. For whoever is not against you is for you. Hallelujah. Now, seven spiritual nuggets in this uh, few scriptures here. <clears throat> now, Jesus said, number one, we need to extend hospitality. Because extending hospitality, uh, love wishing upon others, being good to others, and welcoming others, this is part of the extending of hospitality. It's actually lawful. It's actually in the law of God that we would welcome and even receive strangers, uh, those who pass by the city, those who pass by the town, so that they can have a place to lodge. So this law of hospitality is in the Old Testament. Now, according to this law, out of God's love and generosity, Jesus said, whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me. Now, this is number two. The little child could mean two things. Number one, literally a little child, which is less than 12 years old. You know, just maybe five, six, seven years old. Little child who are innocent and who may not know how to do a lot of things, who need help and parenting. So little child. Now, number two, little child means those who are born into the kingdom of God. And they're just beginning to drink spiritual milk. And that means they are little ones who are beginning to just learn to live life. As one is born into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit, he becomes a new creation. The Spirit of God lives inside of him, and his spirit being is alive. So that person who is just a newborn in the body of Christ can be 5 years old, can be 20 years old. He can be 75, 80 years old but newborn into the kingdom of God. Now that's called the little children or the little one. Here, <clears throat> this little child. So that person may not, uh, you know, may not be acquainted with the ways of faith and uh, may not be able to do a lot of things in faith for the kingdom of God yet, you know, because he's not trained yet. But we are to receive them. That means for these two kinds, they are of the vulnerable, a defenseless type. We are to welcome them in the name of Jesus. So that means you want to treat them with the love of God and with the truth of God. You are receiving them, you're welcoming them, you're blessing them, you're helping them in, in the name of Jesus Christ. You are actually welcoming Jesus. As you do that, knowing that you are a child of God, you want to treat them well like that. You are actually receiving them in the name of Jesus. You are welcoming Jesus Christ. And number three, whoever welcomes me, says the Lord Jesus, welcomes the Heavenly Father. So Heavenly Father comes onto the scene in your life, in your family, in the works of your hands, and in your lifestyle. That's a great thing because the presence of Father God, the Son Jesus Christ, and the indwelling Holy Spirit is with us. 
And number three, he who is least among you all, he is the greatest. Why is it like that? Because he would depend and he would lean on everything that is of his father. Everything that is of Father God. And God comes to shelter and protect and bless the person. He who is least among you. So we considered ourselves nothing. This is the year 5784. It also means the year of not just open door, but humility. If you considered yourself having nothing, you humble yourself before God, and then you receive everything from Him. You are the most blessed because Father God will lavish upon you. But one thing for sure, humility comes before promotion. So you wanted to remain in a humble position before the living God, knowing that He's your covering and He's God above you. He has your interest in His heart. He says, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to keep you hope in the future. So you want to receive the plan of God written concerning you in heaven. Even before you live out each day, they are already written for you for every day. You want to welcome his plan to come to pass in your life with the precious thoughts of God upon you, more numerous than the sin. And when you wake up, that means you live every day. His presence is with you. So I pray for all of us. I mean, not just for uh, this church, but for every brothers and sisters who are, who are watching uh, this broadcast, that in Jesus' mighty name, we humble ourselves before you, Heavenly Father. Um, this year, 5784, also a year of humility. We know that humility means we consider ourselves having nothing. And we bow before you to worship you. We say what we have belongs to you. And we are now receiving everything from you in the mighty name of Jesus. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And number five, um, this is concerning using the name of Jesus Christ. Now, Christ Jesus, after his death and resurrection, he has dealt away with sin, he has dealt away with uh, curses and sickness and disease and all the works of the devil. He died in our place, he was buried in our place, and then he rose from the dead in our place. He overcame all things and he sat at the right hand of God. And Father God is so pleased that he gave him the name that is above all names, that is, uh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So Jesus, having his title and his name now upon him, he has given us his delegated authority. So that we as the children of God, we have inheritance from him. Not just eternal life, but, but every authority and every right to rule and govern in the kingdom of God, in heaven and on earth. Seated with Jesus Christ at the right hand of God. Now this is powerful. And John now, being a, you know, the apostle, one of the apostles of Jesus Christ, saw somebody was driving out demons in the name of Jesus. Here speaks to us, point number four, that we have been given, dedicated the authority to be able to drive out demons, and it is in the name of Jesus. Jesus did pray the high priest prayer when he came before Father God. In John 17, he said, Father God, in verse 12, protect them with the name that you have given to me. That's King of Kings and Lord of Lords, above all all titles and above all powers and above all dominion. Jesus Christ rules and reigns. And that he says, protect them with the name that you have given to me. Even though they're in this world, they're not of this world. And you would keep them so that they would not be lost. So this is powerful. Point number four, we can drive out demons in the name of Jesus. Not just drive out demons. It is not on our own power, but in the name of Jesus. And then number five, whoever wants to, in Jesus' name, drive out demons, do not stop the person. Say, for example, in your ministry, you, uh, yes, you, you do uh, drive out demons, you uh, bring forth healing, deliverance, I mean, you bring salvation. But when you see other ministers, other people are doing it in the name of Jesus and casting out demons by setting people free, do not stop them. 
simply because when they are not in your ministry, you should not stop them from doing the ministry that God has entrusted to them to do. Because they do it in the name of Jesus, and it is effective. So respect the Lordship of Jesus. All believers now, all believers in Christ can cast out demons in Jesus' name. So do not stop them. And because uh, you don't want a segregation between you and the other ministry. Number six, Jesus said, do not stop them. Because whoever is not against us is, uh, is not against you, is for you. So point number six is this. Jesus is saying, not just only you're doing a ministry, you're doing what Jesus calls you to do. He also called others who are in his name uh, to do ministries according to their kind. But it is Jesus who calls and Jesus who imparted the anointing. Jesus was given the name and delegated authority even to that ministry to do what he wants them to do. So this is a call for us to work together as one in the body of Christ. Uh, some are hands and some are, you know, feet. Some are hearts. Some are, you know, shoulders. So each one should be connected one with another and not rejecting each one's function and ministry. And then number seven, this is a powerful thing. Not just only unity and connectedness in the body of Christ, but Jesus is saying they are not against you. They are for you. So what they do will be of help to your ministry, of help to your function in the body of Christ also. So this is a mutual helping and ministering of, uh, to one another, even as, as each one is serving in his or her post in the ministry. So Father and Father God, I pray that there will be a respect across all the body of Christ for all the ministries that you set up in your name. And thank you that you have given us your name and we can cast out demons and bring forth healing and bring forth deliverance and salvation. We are so thankful. Uh, we respect and we say for each of the ministries that you have delegated to each one. And when we see that they are effective in casting out demons, we say, Lord, let your name be praised. Because that ministry would be of help to us also. Let there be unity, oneness in the body of Christ. And let there be a mutual connection in the body of Christ, so that the whole body will be connected together and function well together. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 19. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 19. If you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and worship and bow down to them, I testify against you today that you will surely be destroyed. Now, this is um, a strong and a serious reminder for us. See, we, we say we bow down to worship the true living God who, who is creator God. He says, I am the only God and apart from me there is no other. Because he himself proclaims that he himself is God and we acknowledge him and we bow down to serve him and give our lives in allegiance to him. He owns our lives and he puts his Holy Spirit inside of us and we are his, chopped and sealed and with the deposit of the Holy Spirit inside of us so that we can be taken in rapture to go into the eternal kingdom of God. So as you say that the Lord is your God, there are four things here. Number one, four spiritual reminders. Number one, do not forget the Lord your God. This is in all the areas of your life where you conduct your entire life every day, 24 hours a day, 12 hours of daytime, 12 hours of nighttime, whether it is morning, whether it is in the evening, or whether it is the nighttime, that we do not forget the Lord our God. So it is a focus, it is an intentional focus and a dedication to Him, to serve Him and honor Him as God. This is respect. And number two, the forgetting of God can lead you to stray away and begin to follow other gods, whether consciously or unconsciously, knowingly or unknowingly. So there's a danger of forgetting God because 
we need to have a focus. We need to be covered under Godship. You know, without the covering and the Lordship of God and focusing on Him, you may drift away. So God is cautioning us about the drifting away from Him. And when you drift away and consider something else, it doesn't matter which one. It can be your children. It can be your husband and wife. It can be money. It can be something that you really uh, treasure. You know, even uh, precious jewels. So God is saying, if you would drift away from Him and not focusing on Him, you can even elevate those other things to become God, to replace the place of God in your life. So Father God, I pray now, thank you for cautioning us and that I pray in Jesus' name. I rededicate myself to you because this is the Feast of Hanukkah, uh, the Feast of Dedication. And it is the repairing of the temple season. And Jesus walked in the temple at the colonnade of Solomon, at the porch of Solomon. So Father God, we pray to receive your wisdom in order to discern that Jesus is Lord in our lives. And that we need the Holy Spirit of God to repair us. We are the temple of the living Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father God, for cautioning us that our focus and our gaze would be back unto Jesus, the Lord of our lives. He who dwells in us is the Holy Spirit. And that we will regard nothing else as more important than you, O oh Lord, but only you. Forgive us, we repent and turn from any focusing on something else, could be people, could be things, that would be more than you. Please forgive us of this sin. We repent and turn from that. And we say, Father God, fill us now afresh with your Holy Spirit. We rededicate us this temple to you. And fill us afresh, O Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, let Jesus be Lord over this, our temple. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. It's a rededication. And number three, um, the worship of other things, meaning you are bowing down to them. That means you're subjecting yourself to other types of powers and influences. You know, as you live every day in this world, whether you know it or not, sometimes you may succumb to the threats or the oppressive atmosphere of others upon you. You may compromise and you may give in to whatever they are forcing upon you. So if you are not bowing down to God to worship Him, you have no power in yourself in order to resist those oppress, oppressive uh, persons or environment. It could be um, a governmental structure, it could be a company, a business, it could be a law firm, it could be you know anything that would come uh, that would come and bring a threat to you. So as you worship the Lord God and come under His covering, any of the derailment and the oppression that may come upon you, you can resist and you can stand up upon the Word of God and say no to them, and then you would be victorious to overcome them. They would leave. Those oppressive, everything will leave because you don't want to bow down. We are made in the image of God. You should not subject yourself under some other image that is not God's image. Because His image in you is more important than uh, any other images. Hallelujah. So I pray, Father God, that you would cause us to lead us, Lord, to surrender and that we are bowing down to, to you, O oh Lord God, to worship you. Whatever forces that want to cause us to bend and to, you know, especially in, in ethical issues or non-ethical issues, to bow to the requests of men and uh, to succumb under systems and oppressions, we say no in Jesus' name. We stand for the truth. And we will not bow down to anything except to the living God in Jesus' mighty name, in our morality and consideration. Amen? In the choices we make. Amen? Yes. Let it be today. Yes, Father God, we choose to serve the living God. And as for me and my house, we serve the living God in Jesus' name. Amen. This is our declaration and this is our choice. May the Lord honor us as we honor you. Hallelujah. Now, the path to 
derailment away from the worship of God eventually would lead to slippery path unto destruction. That's the fourth thing. So it's choosing either the path of destruction or choosing the path of life. We decree, we declare, we choose the path of life. May the Lord help us. Amen? Amen. Now the, the other scripture is 1 Timothy chapter 4, from verses 1 to 5. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 5. Knowing that we are in this world, we are not of this world, as the Lord leads us in His Holy Spirit into the coming week, the Lord has given us His words, protection, caution, instructions, and warning, and also His empowerment of the Holy Spirit to live through successfully and coming forth victoriously in Jesus' name. He has fully replenished and fully recharged. Thank you, Holy Spirit. 1 Timothy 4, verse 1. The Holy Spirit now clearly saves. That means He stated it very clear to us so that we may know, that we may be reminded. In the later, latter times, that means in the end times, and as we are walking in the season of the end times, every day as it comes, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. This is a caution, and the Lord has told us ahead of time by His Holy Spirit. Some will succumb to. Some will fall into. Why? Because there is no remembering of the Lord. You know, one thing to help us to forever and always uh, as a lifestyle and uh, becomes a second nature to remember the Lord is that we would have Holy Communion. You can have Holy Communion at home and have communion every day have the body of Jesus and the blood of Jesus to remember Him and to, you know, search yourself by the Holy Spirit and the light that God has shined on you. And He will let you see in where you have fallen, there you can come back again to Him. Just repent and turn from that sin because Jesus bore all of our sins already. As you repent and turn from it, He will give you the power to overcome and go back to Him. You see, Holy Spirit clearly reminds us that in the end times, some will abandon the faith. For those who would not want to stay in the body and the blood of Jesus, they will drift. You see, not remembering the Lord will cause you to drift. And it will come to a place they will abandon the faith. The faith means the believing of the Lord Jesus Christ and everything about His kingdom and what He teaches. And then the abandonment will lead them to go another path to follow something else. It is not the Holy Spirit. So since it's Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth, if you don't follow the Holy Spirit, you are following deceiving spirits that teaches you lies and um, some fabricated thing, which is not the truth. It could be half truth and half lies. Twisting of the scripture, but not having the true meaning of the intention of God in the scripture. Now, those are deceiving things. They are schemes to try to twist teachings in order for one to walk the path that is a derailment. So they would follow deceiving spirits, spirits plural, instead of following the spirit of truth, the spirit of God. And then things taught by demons. So that means there are things that come from the realm or the tree of the knowledge of good and evil which is fallen knowledge. They are deceiving, deceptive knowledge from the dark side of the world and not truth coming from the tree of life, which is from the kingdom of God. So from then comes such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose conscience have been seared as with a hot iron. That means the people, the embodiment, the persons, they are sons of perditions, whom the evil spirits will use for deceptive devices. They would speak about hypocritical truths. I mean, hypo, sorry, hypocritical lies. That means when there is the, not just the words spoken, but it is the intention. You know, the devil can quote scripture. Yes, the devil can quote scripture and says, you know, to Jesus during the temptation, 
you say you said you if you say you're the son of God, you jump from there from the temple, top of the temple. Angels will come and protect you and make sure your foot would not crush upon the stone. Now the devil is quoting scriptures. So you need to see beyond just that religiosity, beyond just um, the literal meaning of the scripture. You need to see behind to see what spirit is speaking it or whose spirit is speaking it. It is God's Holy Spirit that is speaking the intention of God that comes out of love and truth. If that scripture is truly from God. So the devil can come and use the scripture and give literal meaning, which is not the spiritual meaning of God. It is dead. It is destructive. So one who puts faith in the devil's lies, he is disguising himself as an angel of light. There's hypocrisy in him. Fake things, a facade, a disguise in order to trap people, to bring them down. So these are liars because there's no truth in their father, the one that originates this and the one that trains them to do this, is the devil. So they are hypocritical liars. That means they buy into the deceptive teachings of the devil from the dominion of the tree of good and evil. And they try to come and deceive you so that you will go the wrong way. Their consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. You know, once we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, our conscience will no longer so condemn us because we cannot be condemned in the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. We cannot be condemned. So today I pray that you will break away from a conscience that so condemns you. It's called a guilt conscience. It's got a shame conscience. It's actually a guilt conscience that you are always aware of sin and that you always have to say, oh, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner, as if Jesus has never died for you on the cross. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Once you, I mean sincerely from your heart, accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you need to pray to accept that Jesus did take your sin. And he had dealt away with your sins. Your sins do not belong to you anymore for a believer. Your sins belong to Jesus. He took them and he dealt with them on the cross. He died in our place. He paid the price full. The blood of Jesus was shed for us. Life is in the blood. This physical life was given up for us to pay for the penalty of sin. That means he paid unto God the Father to satisfy his righteousness by having the sins judged. And he released his life, earthly life, on our behalf to God to fulfill his righteousness. Oh, that's powerful. So our conscience now, after we receive Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior, is not a guilt conscience that says, you sin, you sin, you sin, but a conscience that says, God, we have a God and righteousness conscience that says, Father God, you have provided a way. You forgive us of our sins. As we confess our sins, you are righteous and just. You will forgive me. You will forgive us of all of our sins. So you're not, I mean, even when you face up with, uh, accidentally you fall into sin, you are not afraid and you do not feel condemned. Why? Because you know all your sins are judged upon Jesus and that sin do not belong to you, belong to Jesus. So you say, Father God, thank you for helping me to realize that I have fallen into the sin. I'm aware of it. Thank you for this grace. Now, please, you have dealt away this sin. Forgive me. I repent. I turn from it. This is important. You must have repentance before forgiveness will be given to you. So you repent and turn from it and ask Jesus to help you. You want to decide not to do it again. And then ask God to forgive you. He is faithful and just to deal away with your sin. Not loving and compassionate, but righteous and just. He would punish that sin upon Jesus. For he did punish the sin upon Jesus. That's why he is righteous and just. 
and he will forgive you of that sin once you repent and turn from it. Hallelujah. So that our conscience would be of God, godly, holy, washed by the blood of Jesus, righteous conscience. But those who are against the Lord, those who practice lies and deception, they kept their sins. That's why their conscience so accused them and saying that you have sinned, you have sinned, and they feel remorse and they feel regret. See, they don't repent, they feel regretful only, and they begin to cover up. Simply because they do not part with that evil, and they would continue to sin if nobody else is watching. Hallelujah. Theirs is seared with as a hot iron, burned until they are numb. No morality, no consciousness of what is good and right and perfect in the eyes of God. So they will continue to participate in sin, being deceived by the devil and the sons of perditions, and will continue to be deceived. This is very powerful, powerful. Now, for those who do not practice the truth of God, they will have teachings to restrain you or to restrict you. But God gives us freedom out of his truth. When you acknowledge the Son of Man, you are in relationship with him. When you acknowledge his truth, the truth sets you free. Where his Holy Spirit is, there is freedom. But those who do not acknowledge the spirit of truth, they do not enter into freedom. They enter into bondage. So false teachings would trap you and bind you and say, this you cannot do, that you cannot do. You have to watch this. You have to make sure you're living in such and such uh, of boundaries. Now that's bondage. That's not freedom. They forbade people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods. That means God has given people the covenant of marriage. Marriage is a covenant, it's not a contract. Such that you can say, I can break away, you know? And then what is your condition? And what is my condition? And then we agree on the condition, then we get married. No, that's not marriage from the covenant of God. Marriage does not originate with people, human, but marriage is God's gift for humanity. So unless you are given the gift of celibacy, that means the ability to stay single, unless for the kingdom of God you want to abstain from marriage, then everyone should be married. And it's one man, one woman, under a covenant. Now that's God's marriage. Covenant keeping God, who gives us that covenant to keep with one another. Now covenant means unless that party dies, that covenant cannot be resolved, cannot be uh, untied. So covenant is for lifetime. It is not a contract to break. Hallelujah. And I pray, Father God, let your anointing come upon brothers and sisters in their marriage covenant. To know that it is a covenant and it is not, uh, it is not a contract. That as you have called the husband and the wife to come into the marriage, that in Jesus' name, each one will keep the covenant with you to honor you, to fear you, and to treat the other party the way that you wanted to love them and to treat them. So that the person will be built up and not tear down. So that the person will be blessed and protected and will grow uh, to become mature in the likeness of Jesus Christ. Father God, thank you for companionship in marriage, to walk through life in your presence that one can be for one another and to build godly marriages and to have godly heirs. This is your will for your people made in your image. And so I speak your blessing to come upon marriages today for such a breakthrough so that your people will know that they would know that they would know marriage is a covenant and it is not a contract to honor you and to fear you in Jesus mighty name. Amen. And the Lord will bring changes to the person in the marriage covenant. If you would keep that marriage covenant first with God, then to your spouse. Hallelujah. Now, the second thing is, do not abstain from eating things that God has so blessed you with. You know, 
So God wants us to enjoy life and to enjoy all that the Lord, the Lord has provided for us to enjoy. There are some that gives you restrictions and laws and rules and regulations, but you know God has given you freedom to choose and to eat and to do what is beneficial and what is good. See, the scripture has said, you know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we, I mean, we are free. We can do all things, but not all things are permissible. We can have the freedom to do everything with the power of God, but not everything is beneficial. So exercise that authority inside of you in the image of God and begin to choose to do and also to eat what is beneficial. Yes, you can eat pork with fat, you know, but you don't have to choose to eat the fat, which is not good for your body, is what I'm saying. Now, you don't have to abstain from certain foods, but my counsel concerning blood, because blood has been promised by God to be used uh, to redeem a person. So life is in the blood. My my um, suggestions to you, my counsel to you, is that you should not be eating blood. That's one thing. Now, God has also created all the good things for us to enjoy, for us to receive with thanksgiving. So just know that there are so many things upon this earth that God has created for us to partake in since creation. So freely choose and freely enjoy. Yes, but give thanks to the Lord. That's prayer of thanksgiving to cleanse the food. You say in Jesus' name, thank you for all these foods that you have provided for me. Cleanse them to the use of my body and cause me to remain in good health in Jesus' name. Amen? And then your conscience clean, clear, you partake, you enjoy, no problem. Give thanks to God and celebrate and rejoice in freedom. It's just that when you... Say, for example, when you drink wine, yes, you can drink wine, but do not, um, do not become um, unconscious. Be sober, you know? Be sober. Whatever you take and eat, make sure it's a proper dosage that is for health. Then that will be good for you. Now, pray and bless the food all the time. Do it as a habit because this can save you and cleanse every ungodly thing from it. Supernaturally, God can do that. And who know the truth. That means we know the truth. The truth sets us free. We are above all these things. We have the mind of Christ. We, are, we cannot be judged by all, all things and people. But we have the mind of Christ to judge all things. So we can discern what is good, what is a balance, what is healthy, what is not healthy. May the Lord help us to rise above all circumstances and peoples and to begin to rule and reign in His image. In Jesus' mighty name, over all things. Amen? Yes, we do not judge people because we bring them, we pray for them, we bring them to Jesus who judges all sins. He dealt away with all sins. So we judge the situations and we bring the peoples before Jesus that he may deal away with their sins. Father God, I pray. Oh, yes, Lord. Thank you for freedom. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the image of Christ inside of us. Thank you that now, as we are in Christ, we have the image of God inside of us. And we can rule and reign on the heights. And it's not ruling over people. It's not reigning over whatever. But it is ruling and reigning over everything so that they would not come under the power of the devil so that they will not come under the power of the evil one. The evil kingdom and the evil ways of doing things and ways of thinking and uh, ways of speaking and destruction. We rise up above all of that and we speak life, we speak spiritual order, we speak the good, perfect will of God upon every circumstance and peoples so that they will be governed under the truth of Jesus Christ for life. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Oh, I pray, Father God, that these principles will be at work in us and in full operation so that we become mature in the likeness of Jesus Christ. 
Holy Spirit do it unto us and perfect us, Lord, so that we will be every single person as Christ. And it is Christ who will live inside of us and not us living inside of us. For we belong to Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I pray that there's lifelong principles and the principles of life will be of good use to us, not just throughout this coming week, but for the rest of our lives. Thank you for tuning in to this week of Insights for the Week. I, I mean, my prayer is that uh, the Lord will continue to walk with us and talk with us, and we can celebrate His presence. See you next time for more of Insights for the Week. God bless.